Gobble, 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 Sasha shouted, doing a little victory dance at the foul line, as the pin setter under the neon pizza above the end of their lane set ten pins into place. The pins quivered a little before they settled, probably afraid that Sasha was going to wipe them out again with her spinning ball. They didn't have to worry, it was Abe's turn, and his ball, sadly, wasn't as dangerous. Abe grinned as he stood to give Sasha a fist bump. So, this is your hidden dark side, gloating when you're wiping out your opponent? I have to warn you, Sasha had said when they'd taken their seats behind the scoring screen on lane three in Bonnie Bowl. I'm kind of obsessive about bowling. I'm pretty good at it, and I can get a little competitive about it. No problem, Abe had said. I'm not very good, so you can wipe the lane with me and I won't get upset. Sasha laughed. Okay, one lane wiping coming up. It was late, and Bonnie Bowl was rocking. Most of the 22 lanes were being used, and the lines at the ice cream and drinks counter were long. Kids chased one another up and down the white, neon-lit stairs that separated the snack and service area from the lanes themselves. They also ran up and down along the neon star-covered end walls that flanked the, light, the lanes. The whole bowling alley was such bedlam that Abe couldn't imagine how anyone could concentrate enough to bowl well. Sasha, however, was managing just fine. The overhead scoring screen was still flashing turkey. <laughs> turkey. <laughs> turkey. Uh, as Sasha gobbled and danced her way back to the ball return. A couple of teen girls in the next lane were giving Sasha dirty looks for her excessive celebration, but Sa Sasha's self-congratulation didn't bother Abe at all. He thought it was cute. He especially liked the little hip wiggle in Sasha's victory dance. When Sasha was done dancing around, Abe stepped up to the line and threw a relatively accurate ball. He knocked down eight pins. Way to go! Sasha called out from her seat at the scoring table. Now get that spare! Piece of cake, Abe said sarcastically. He figured he had about as much chance at the spare as he did at extric... Extri extricating, extricating. <laughs> he had as much chance at the spare as he did at extricating himself from his ongoing apartment predicament. Abe retrieved his ball and threw it again. The ball wobbled a little, hugged the edge of the gutter, then made a miraculous curve back toward the six and ten pins. The pins fell down. Abe whooped. Nice spare, Sasha shouted, jumping up from her chair. When Abe got back to her, when Abe got back to her, she gave him a quick kiss. The kiss made Abe even happier than the spare had done. After Sasha finished annihilating Abe, she, she asked, Want to bowl another line? Abe shook his head. How about saving that for another night? There's something I'd like to talk to you about. Can we go for a walk? Uh-oh, you sound serious. Sasha grinned and gave Abe a little nudge. Do I need to be worried? Abe twisted his mouth. Was he doing the right thing? He shrugged. I think I, uh, yeah. I think it's time I told you how I got all the cuts. Sasha's grin faded. Okay. Abe didn't want to talk about his troubles inside the pizza plex. There were too many ears. He suggested that he and Sasha walk to a nearby park. The evening was cool and clear, and Sasha said a walk beneath the stars sounded romantic. By the, uh, by the time Abe and Sasha reached an isolated bench near a pond, Sasha probably had changed her mind about the romance. Abe had just finished giving her a detailed description of everything that had happened in the apartment, after telling her about the devious way he'd gotten into it in the first place, and why he'd been so desperate to get into it. Now they sat in silence. Sasha hadn't spoken since Abe had started telling his story, but she'd listened intently. She was still holding his hand. That was a good sign, wasn't it? But after a full minute of listening to proverbial and literal crickets, Abe couldn't take it anymore. He cleared his throat. You think I'm making it up, don't you? Sasha squeezed his hand. Not at all. She shifted so she could look directly at him. I totally believe you. Abe exhaled loudly. Whew, that's a relief. I was afraid you'd think I was crazy. Any normal person would... I'm not a normal girl, Sasha said. Abe smiled at her. I think I love you. Sasha laughed. That's a conversation for another time. Right now, we need to figure out what's really going on here. 
She cocked her head. Are you sure the Gen 1s are trying to kill you? Abe jerked away from her. What kind of question was that? He motioned to his healing cuts. How else do you explain this? Sasha bit her lower lip. Well, they could just be acting out. Maybe they don't really mean to hurt you. It could be they're just out of control, and what's been happening to you is the fallout. I don't get it. Another couple stroll into view. Sasha watched them go past, then she scooted closer to Abe and spoke in low tones. Listen, the kids I work with, they've been through so much trauma that it messes with their heads. They act out. It's normal with kids who have been mistreated. They have so much pain inside that they need to let it out somehow. They usually let it out in totally inappropriate ways. Sometimes they break things, steal things, and hurt their caregivers. They're not bad kids. They've just had really, really bad luck. They don't know how to deal with it. So they get in trouble. What I'm thinking is that the Gen 1s might be doing something similar. Abe thought back over all the ways he'd been injured. Could what Sasha say be true? Could, I just messed it up. Could what Sasha was saying be true? If I were you, Sasha said, I'd want to find out more about the previous tenant. Landon Prout. Yeah, Landon. Who was he? Did he do something to the Gen 1s? Is he the reason they're so badly damaged? If so, it might explain their behaviour. Abe thought about that. He had to admit he had wondered why the Gen 1s were in such bad shape. Was Landon Prout responsible for what had happened to them? Abe wasn't sure he believed Sasha's theory, but she had a point about Landon. Maybe knowing more about his predecessor was a good idea. I'm pretty sure I have the Gen 1s contained, Abe said, but it would be nice to know more. I'll do some digging. Sasha laid her head against his shoulder. Good. Until then, be really careful, huh? I don't know about the whole love thing yet, but I am getting rather fond of you. If... For some reason, your padlock fails. I'd hate to see you sliced and diced and barbecued before we can see where this can go. Abe smiled when he felt Sasha shake in silent laughter. He kissed the top of her head. I'll do my best to stay in one piece. It wasn't difficult to hack into the Pizzaplex's employee database. Abe got to his desk early the next day so he could do it before anyone else came in. Within minutes, he was looking at Landon's personnel file. And Landon's file was really interesting. His file was thick with psychological reports. Landon apparently was being treated for paranoia, resulting from his work at the Pizzaplex. Landon exhibits the classic signs of delusional paranoid disorder, a report stated. Landon feels persi <laughs> uh, persecuted. Oh, persecuted. <laughs> <laughs> Landon feels persecuted by nearly everyone and everything in the Pizzaplex, and he believes in outlandish conspiracy theories related to Fazbear Entertainment. Landon's delusion is related directly to the animatronics, which he believes are stalking him and want to kill him. At this point, I was genuinely like, oh my god, Abe, Abe is totally delusional. He's like making all this up in his head. Maybe this isn't real, because he was just talking, he was just talking to Sasha about it, it, like her not believing it because maybe it's not real in, in the entirety. Anyway, Abe looked up from his screen and glanced around to be sure he was still alone. Was the poor guy really delusional or was he actually being stalked? After what Abe had been through, he had more sympathy for Landon than judgment. Abe scrolled through the rest of Landon's file, but he didn't learn anything else. There was no record of Landon returning to work after his leave of absence and no record of his being hospitalized. 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 Abe clicked through the file until he returned to Landon's contact info. There was a phone number. Abe picked up his phone. He put it down. He picked it up. He punched in the number. A woman who sounded half asleep. Abe looked at the clock and saw it was before 7.30am. Oops. Answered with a... What? I'm really sorry to be calling so early, but I'm trying to reach Landon. The woman sucked in her breath. Then she started to cry. Is, is this a joke? What? N no, not at all. I just... Landon's gone. The phone clicked in Abe's ear. Hello? A dial tone answered him. Abe put down his phone. What did Landon's gone mean? Gone as in moved away? Gone as in missing? Gone as in dead? 
Abe leaned back and looked out the window. Shaking his head, he turned to his desk and opened his email. He pulled his keyboard forward and started typing. Hi, Mom. How are you feeling today? I'm doing okay. I have a little mystery on my hands. Remember how we used to watch mystery movies together? I'm going to have to put my thinking cap on to solve this one. I love you, Abe. Abe leaned back on Sasha's bright blue well-cushioned sofa. Unlike Abe's place, Sasha's space was filled with colour. Red walls, a wood floor painted with red, blue and purple stripes. Red and purple polka dot draped, uh, drapes. Uh, the bright blue sofa and matching chairs, an eye-catching array of vivid modern art and dramatic photographs that Sasha had taken, and an eclectic... What the hell are these words? Exceltic... Ex exletic... Exletic. It looks like electric, but the the letters are, like, anagrammed. And an and exceletic... <laughs> Mix of knickknacks and trinkets in all shapes and sizes filled the apartment with character and pizzazz. I'm so sorry I'm messing this up, by the way. I'm, I'm terrible at reading, but I hope you're enjoying it nevertheless. Whereas Abe's place looked like it was staged for a magazine layout, Sasha's place looked lived in. Abe liked it. I did some more digging just before I came over here, Abe said as Sasha dished up the fish and chips she'd gotten from a food truck near her building. But I didn't find anything else. Sasha brought him a plate of fried food. He took it. The tangy scent of the lemon tucked against his battered cod tickled his nostrils. Sasha sat down on the sofa next to Abe. So, we don't know whether Landon was paranoid because the animatronics really were out to get him, or whether he was paranoid because he just thought they were. Either way, if he lived in an apartment with robots, it's highly likely he might have tried to destroy them. I think that's... I think what you found supports my theory. Abe nodded. He thought so too. But how does that help me? He asked. Sasha chewed a french fry. She swallowed it and picked up another one. She jabbed the air with the next fry as she spoke. From what I've read about Fazbear Entertainment's animatronics, they're programmed to approximate human behaviour. That suggests that the Gen 1s might quite reasonably be reacting to the damage Landon potentially did. Sasha ate the pointer fry. After she swallowed, she picked up another fry. Abe stuck a fry in his own mouth. Sasha pointed her fry at Abe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I think I should spend the night at your place. Abe choked on his fry. Sasha laughed. That's not what I meant. She swatted his thigh. I'm not talking romance. I'm talking research. <laughs> Sex joke. Um, I want to observe the gem ones for myself. But I told you about the paddle. Oh, wait, no. Oh... Oh, wait, I, I, can, I read that completely wrong. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let me just, let me make this more intimate, okay? Imagine, like, romantic music in the background. Sasha ate the pointer fry. After she swallowed, she picked up another fry. Abe stuck a fry in his own mouth. Sasha pointed her fry at Abe. I think I should spend the night at your place. Abe choked on his fry. Sasha laughed. That's not what I meant, she swatted his thigh. I'm not talking romance, I'm talking research. I want to, ob I want to observe the gem ones for myself. But I told you about the padlock, Abe said. Ever since Abe had installed the padlock, he'd made it part of his morning and evening routine to check it. This morning, his heart had dropped from his chest into his feet when he'd found the hasp dangling from its screws, which were nearly out of their holes. The gen ones had defeated the padlock hasp, so the padlock was useless. Yeah, I know, Sasha said. They can get out again, and they're dangerous. She gestured at his red scored arms. Obviously, but I think you should let them come out, and we'll watch them. I'm trained to see the signs of acting out, and even if I wasn't, I might see something about them that you've missed, because you're so freaked out. Abe frowned and opened his mouth. That's not a diss. Sasha gently patted his arm. Honestly, I'd be freaked out in your position too. But because you've told me everything instead of me experiencing it myself, I think I can look at things a little more objectively than you can. Whatever I might see in your apartment will be clearer to me. There's no shock factor gumming up my works. Abe thought about that. It made sense. 
From the very first incident in his apartment, he'd been reacting instead of analysing. Since he wasn't sure how to contain the Gen 1s now, maybe studying them wasn't a bad idea. And maybe a fresh set of eyes could help. But would it be safe? I'm not as fragile as I look, Sasha said, winking at Abe. She grinned. Her grin did nothing to ease Abe's sudden tension. I didn't think you were, but... But, no buts. We'll go back to your place when we're done eating. The Bobby Dots were very happy that Sasha was staying the night. Yay, a sleepover! Rose squealed. We have to have snacks! Sleepovers have many benefits, Olive said. They are a great way to experience new things. They help build up independence. They strengthen relationships. They enhance communication skills. And they're fun! Rose crowd. <laughs> Sasha laughed. She leaned toward Abe and whispered, That list applies to kids' sleepovers, but she means well. <laughs> Abe glanced at Olive. Did Olive narrow her eyes at Sasha? Just a little. I'll put on some music, Gemini said. Soft rock began playing. How about cheese and crackers? Rose said. Or those little mini tacos in the freezer? Those would be good for some salsa. And some... We just had dinner, Abe interrupted. Rose thrust out her lower lip. Why don't we all just go hang out in the bathroom, Sasha said. A and talk, she quickly added when Abe and the Bobby Dots gave her wide-eyed looks. <laughs> I love how that's just how that section ends. By the time 2am rolled around, the Bobby Dots had gone dark. Rose had winked out when it became clear that food wasn't in the forecast for the night. Gemini let out a dramatic sigh and disappeared when Sasha asked if the music could be turned off, and Olive signed off when Abe told her that her encyclopedic knowledge of bowling wasn't necessary during Abe and Sasha's discussion of their next bowling date. Abe and Sasha had been too keyed up to sleep. After a while, they were even too antsy to talk. They ended up sitting next to each other, holding hands, just listening. At 2.08am, Sasha gripped Abe's hand. Did you hear that? She whispered. He nodded. The Gen 1s were coming out. He could hear the hushed stuffing, uh, snuffling uh, sound of their cables brushing along the walls and partitions. Ready? Abe whispered. Sasha took a deep breath. She nodded. Together, they got off of the bed and crept to the bedroom door. Pausing there, they listened. The faint swishing sounds were moving away. Remember, be really quiet, he told Sasha. She nodded again. Abe used the Mr. Hippo magnet and unlocked the door. They padded softly out into the sitting area. Abe pointed. Sasha's eyes widened when she saw Two's ghastly torn torso slink over the sofa and head toward the kitchen. To her credit, though, Sasha didn't make a sound. Abe pointed again. Sasha turned to watch One and Three move out of the dining room, uh, around the dining room table, and split up. One went into the office. Three roamed around the kitchen. Roamed wasn't the right word, though. Three wasn't meandering. She was moving purposefully, as if on a mission. Abe and Sasha stepped close to the panel separating the sitting area from the kitchen. Sasha turned to watch Two. Abe watched both Sasha and Two. When Two bent over a plug-in socket, Sasha nudged Abe. She pointed emphatically at the decrepit robot. Abe watched as Two pulled out a couple of wires from the socket and disconnected them. Abe raised an eyebrow as he noticed that one of the wires, a thin, exposed copper wire, ran from the plug to the floor and extended from there along the length of the baseboard toward the apartment door. What was that wire doing there? And why did Two disconnect it? Sasha tugged on Abe's sleeve. He leaned down. I think they're trying to help you, not hurt you, Sasha whispered. Her whisper was low. Unfortunately, it was not low enough. Two let out a screech. One and three immediately joined in. All three Gen 1 sprinted towards Sasha and Abe. Abe yelled, run! Because two was between him and the bedroom. Abe ran around the sofa and bolted toward the dining area. He assumed Sasha would be right behind him. When he got to the dining table, he looked back. Sasha hadn't followed him. The Gen 1s were still careening uh, towards Sasha. But when they reached her, they didn't touch her. Their cables thrashed around them. 
When one of three's cables flicked towards Sasha, she leaned back out of its reach. She turned to watch the Gen 1 circle around and head back toward the kitchen, back toward Abe. They don't care about Sasha, Abe thought. They were after him, and only him. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you, Abe thought. Abe turned and ran into the kitchen. The robots kept coming. They surrounded him. Their, ta their cables tangled around him like the arms of an enraged octopus. He dodged right and left to avoid the cords biting assault. Abe's heart pounded. He could hear it thrumming its ears. He could hear it thrumming in his ears. He was doing better than he'd done the last time he'd encountered the Gen 1s though. For the most part, he was evading the Gen 1s grasping hands and writhing cables. He only felt a few stings. Abe leaped over to scuttling form and started to run past the refrigerator just as one of three cables sna uh, snagged the huge appliance. The fridge toppled toward Abe. Surrounded, Abe couldn't move fast enough to get out of the way. He screamed and threw up his hands. The Gen 1 swarmed over the top of him. Abe flailed, battling away the robot's hands and cables. He was out of his head with panic. It felt like he was being smothered and compressed and cleaved into a dozen parts. Suddenly, Abe felt Sasha's hand close over his. Come on, Sasha shouted. Abe wasn't sure he could move. The Gen 1s were overwhelming him. But he let Sasha pull him, and in a matter of seconds, amazingly, he was free of the robot's clutches. Only the tips of their cables swiped at his legs as he teetered after Sasha. Sasha let go of Abe's hand and grabbed his arm. She took most of his weight as she helped him sk uh, hurry around the sofa and shoot toward the bedroom doorway. Once they were through the door, Sasha slammed it shut. She locked it. Abe shoved the dresser in front of it. Breathless, Abe bent over and panted. Sasha put a hand on his shoulder, catching her own breath as well. Finally, Abe straightened. See what I mean? Sasha shook her head. Actually, I don't. Abe gaped at her. Sasha took Abe's hand and led him to the bed. She sat and pulled him down next to her. Together, they listened to the Gen 1's retreat. Sasha looked up when she heard a scraping sound overhead. After several seconds, the sound stopped. The apartment went quiet. Sasha turned and looked into Abe's eyes. They're not trying to hurt you, she said. They're trying to protect you. What? Sasha grabbed Abe's forearm. I understand. You're freaked. But I want you to think about what you saw in the living room. You saw two disconnect those wires, right? Abe nodded. Yeah. What was she doing? I've never seen that one wire before, the one that led to the door. I think that wire was part of a trap. If it was connected to the plug circuit, the apartment door would have been electrified. It could have killed us if we'd reached for the door handle. I think two was undoing a trap, not setting one. Abe replayed the scene in his mind. Sasha was right. Okay, but they tried to get me in the kitchen, he said. Sasha shook her head. They weren't trying to get you. They were trying to help you. But they were all over me, Sasha nodded. I know, but remember, we're dealing with damaged robots. They can't function well. I know it felt like they were swarming you, but they were actually trying to shield you. I saw the whole thing. I think they were trying to be like bodyguards, surrounding you to keep dangers away. Didn't you see what happened when the fridge started to fall? Three pulled it over. No, three tried to stop it when it started to fall over. She didn't start it. But I saw it, Abe. I saw the whole thing. They were all around you, trying to make, like, I don't know, a fortress around you or something. The fridge started to fall. Three whipped out a cable to try to snag it because she wasn't close enough to grab it. Then they all covered you, and while they covered you, they shoved the fridge so it didn't go all the way over. Abe tried to remember the sequence of events. Was that true? He attempted to untangle all the sensations he'd felt, but he couldn't do it. The experience was a snarl of pinching, swiping, and pressing. The fridge didn't fall, Sasha said. If they'd wanted the fridge to crush you, you'd be crushed. But it didn't fall. It tipped, and they pushed it back. Abe opened his mouth to argue, but he had nothing. If the fridge didn't fall, then what happened? Abe thought about all his encounters with the Gen 1s, had they really been trying to help him all along? Abe tried to remember what he'd seen the Gen 1s doing before they'd attacked him the first time, if they had really attacked him. Had he just perceived their actions as an attack, when it really wasn't? 
He tried to dissect the memory and figure out what he'd really experienced. Had the Gen 1s actually meant to hurt him, or had they hurt him by accident? Abe thought even further back. The first time Abe had seen the Gen 1s, he'd expected them to be bad, and he'd been repelled. The creepy cables, the broken endoskeletons, the missing eyes, the ripped off limbs. The Gen 1s were like robotic undead. They had looked like android villains, so he expected them to act like android villains. Abe remembered how he was never able to actually catch the Gen 1 sabotaging the apartment. He'd, he'd assumed they had just been too subtle for him. But what if they hadn't, haven't been sabotaging the apartment at all? What if they'd been checking for sabotage instead? He'd seen them around as if inspecting the area for potential problems. He'd completely misinterpreted the broken Gen 1's actions. They weren't murderous. They were like really, uh, oh my gosh, they were really just, because of their damage, clumsy and inefficient. <clears throat> Abe rubbed his face. Okay, so for the sake of the argument, let's say the Gen 1s are protecting me. Who are they protecting me from? The answer's pretty obvious, don't you think? Sasha said. She widened her eyes and tossed her head as if trying to signal him in some way. Abe didn't get it. Sasha sighed. Think, Abe. If it's not the old robots, it's... She looked pointedly at the glass panels that surrounded the bedroom. Abe looked at the glass panels too. He got it. It was the Gen 2s after all. Abe goggled at the darkened glass. Even though he couldn't see them, he could almost feel the Gen 2s hovering. The holographic bobby dots ran everything in the apartment, and they were never turned off. Even when they were dormant, they'd woken up the night that one and two attacked him, hadn't they? That meant they were listening. Abe grabbed Sasha's hand. They sprang off the bed, galloped across the room, and shoved the dresser aside. Abe threw open the bedroom door. They tore toward the apartment door. They were just a few feet from the apartment door when all the apartment lights went out and the glass panels in the apartment activated. The bobby dots converged one on each of the three closest screens. All of them had their mouths open wide in maniacal grins. All of them were brighter than they'd ever been. Their eyes were nearly double in size. Their pigtails gyrated around their heads like angry serpents. Abe couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was the worst betrayal of his life. Come on, Sasha shouted. She tugged him toward the door. Abe, stupefied, reeled after her. His legs felt like rubber. His heart was battering his chest. Sasha grabbed the apartment door handle. She pressed it down. Nothing happened. Abe put his hand on Sasha's. He pushed too. Nothing. The apartment door was locked. They couldn't get out. Can you reach it? Abe asked. Abe stood with his feet planted wide to keep himself steady. Sasha sat on his shoulders, her legs tucked around his chest. Yeah, barely, Sasha said. Abe looked up at the bobbing yellow circle of light cast by the small flashlight Sasha held in her mouth. He listened to the long metallic scrape of his butcher knife against the ceiling. Sasha grunted. As soon as they'd realised they were trapped, Abe and Sasha had looked around. What could they do? Going out the window wasn't an option. Shouting for help wouldn't do any good. Abe was sure the units were soundproofed. The apartment had started going haywire. Sparks flew from light sockets and plugs. The fridge in the kitchen fell over. Burners came on. Water poured from faucets. Music and news reports blasted. The bobby dots had surged from glass panel to glass panel, a blur of helter-skelter motion that made no sense at all. Their colours pulsed, nearly blinding. Their faces contorted. Static danced around them and cascaded through the apartment. Abe had no idea what to do. Good thing his girlfriend had kept her head on straight. We need to get up to the gem once, Sasha had said urgently. What? Why? Sasha had grabbed Abe's shoulders and shook them. Get a grip. Who's been helping you? Abe blinked. Yeah, but what if their vision of helping kills us? A flashing blue arc of electricity had shot their way. Sasha and Abe had ducked and scurried out of its path. Can it be any worse than this? Sasha had snapped. She had a point. 
Okay, Abe said. Both of them had looked up at the high ceilings. If you stand on the table, Sasha pointed at the dining table, and I sit on your shoulders, I think I can reach it. Narrowly avoiding a flying glass end table, Sasha and Abe had run for the dining table. They'd clambered up onto it. She climbed onto his shoulders. I can reach it, she said, but it won't budge. Is there a lock? Hang on a second. The dining table has slid across the floor. Sasha swore. Then she said, I can't see. There might be a mechanism I can jimmy. I need a flashlight and something to slide into the crack. The kitchen had been going crazy around them, but Abe had left Sasha on the table while he dodged flying canned goods and plates to get to the drawer that held the cutlery and the miscellany drawer, where he kept a small flashlight. A pot had grazed his head and a skillet had whacked his ear, but Abe had been able to reach the drawers. He grabbed the flashlight first, then he reached for a butcher knife. As he did, all of his other knives shot out of the drawer. Sasha! Dark! Abe had shouted as he hit the floor. The knives had whizzed past above his head. He heard them thunk against the glass panel behind the dining table. The glass didn't break. The knives had clattered to the floor. Abe had leaped up and jumped back onto the dining room table. And now Sasha was prodding at the trapdoor crack with her butcher knife. All Abe could do was try to hold her steady as the table bucked under them and more kitchen utensils flew at them. Abe and Sasha grunted every time something hit them. Abe's forehead was pulsing from the impact of a flying spatula. Sasha's arm was bleeding from the slap of a cheese grater. For reasons Abe didn't understand, once the projectiles hit the floor, they stayed there. That was good. If the knives levitated and came at them again, this would be the end. He couldn't dive out of the way with Sasha on his shoulders. Can you get it? Abe asked, cringing when a cutting board slammed against his hip. Sasha didn't answer. Abe looked up to see Sasha barely avoid another jolt of electricity arcing down from the kitchen ceiling light. Abe heard more scraping. The table lurched. Abe gritted his teeth and replanted his feet. He clutched at Sasha's thighs with all of his might. He was not going to drop her, no matter what. The hard rock music that had been playing since the apartment locked down shifted to frenzied classical music. <laughs> the sound seemed to dive under Abe's skin. He could feel it hurtling through his nervous system, trying to tear him apart from the inside. I think I've almost got it, Sasha said. Abe hoped he could last that long. His legs were about to give out. His brain was perilously close to fried. To distract himself, Abe tried talking to the bobby dots. Why are you doing this? He called out. I thought we were friends. You never share your food, Rose wailed. You don't appreciate us, Gemini cried. You take us for granted, Olive shouted. But, Abe's began, <laughs> Abe's began, Abe began. Save your breath, Sasha yelled. I've got it. Abe heard a snap and a thunk, and Sasha's weight lifted from his shoulders. He looked up to see her disappearing up through the hole in the ceiling. Seconds after she was out of sight, she leaned out through the open trapdoor. She reached toward him. Grab my hands. You're not strong enough to pull me up. No, but you can climb up my arms, she shouted. I'm strong enough for that. Just grab on and pretend I'm a rope. Not sure that's how it works, but okay. <laughs> uh, Abe opened his mouth to argue, but the table started to slide out from under him. Electricity began to gather in a network of slashing blue light along the baseboard in the kitchen. The strands of crackling power began building and reaching outward. Abe had no choice. He grabbed one of Sasha's arms. Using the same hand-over-hand -hand motion he'd been taught to use for rope climbing, Abe crawled up Sasha's extended arm until he could get a grip on the trapdoor's frame. Once he had two hands on the frame, Sasha backed out of view. Abe did the best pull-up he'd ever done in his life, until he'd hauled his upper body into the crawl space. From there, he leaned forward and groped around for something to hang onto so he could pull himself further in. His hands encouraged the cold, hard edges of a metal ceiling joist. Abe gripped the joist and levered himself up through the opening. As soon as he was through the doorway, the Bobby Dot screams reaching in behind him. The trap door slammed shut. Abe didn't move for several seconds. He just rested his throbbing, bleeding forehead on the metal joist under him and listened to Sasha's laboured breathing behind him. Below the ceiling, the Bobby Dot's enraged rantings continued. The squeal of strings continued to blast from the speakers. Abe shifted his weight, trying to get a feel for the crawl space. 
The bottom of the crawl space consisted of drywall attached to metal joists, which were placed 16 inches apart. Abe was pretty sure the drywall wouldn't hold their weight. They'd had to balance on the metal joists. Abe tried to shift his weight again, seeking a more comfortable position. Be careful, Sasha whispered. Duh. Before she could say any more, the Gen 1 started wailing. The sound was deafening and close. Abe flipped over and sat up. He didn't even think about whether there would be enough room for him to sit upright. He just knew he didn't want to be lying down when the Gen 1s found them. Thankfully, when Abe sat up, his head ended up a couple inches below the joists above him. Propping his legs on the joists under him, he shifted to face the shilling sound. He stiffened when he looked into the glowing eyes of the three Gen 1s. Two luminous blue orbs, one shining pink orb, and one large blazing green orb were just three feet from Abe. In the dim glow of the small flashlight Sha Sasha aimed at the Gen 1s, Abe could see one and two's cracked white endoskeletons, or exoskeleton, sorry, and two's battered metal endoskeleton. That one actually does say endoskeleton. Their cables coiled around them like a knot of enmeshed black worms. Abe shivered. He started to back away. Sasha's hand closed over his arm. He nearly jumped out of his skin. It's okay. She had to yell to be heard above the Gen 1 screams. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, Abe didn't think it was okay at all. His gaze was locked on the twitching cables. He imagined them reaching out to ensnare him and choke him, all in the service of misguided protection. Completely frozen, unable to think, uh, unable to even think, much less figure out what to do next, Abe watched as the Gem Ones continued to bawl and shudder. His eyes widened when Sasha, perched on two ceiling joists next to Abe, started to scoot closer to the Gem Ones. Don't! Abe cried out. He caught Sasha's hand and pulled her back just in time. Writhing black cables surged out of the darkness and whipped between Sasha and the shadows. The Gen 1's scratchy cater walls got even louder. Even so, Sasha tried to calm the robots. Shh, Sasha said. We know you're trying to help. We know. The broken screeches ended abruptly. In the silence, three single pink eye glowed brighter. Then one's blue eyes and two's green eye brightened. I'm so sorry you've been hurt, Sasha said to the Gen Ones. Abe turned to look at Sasha's profile. She was pale and she had a cut on her cheek. Blood trickled from the gash and ran down her, her neck. She was amazing. Can any of you talk? Sasha asked the Gen Ones. A prolonged hiss preceded a choking gurgle. Then Three's mouth creaked as it hinged open. Kill, Three said. The word came out in several stuttered syllables that sounded like metal clicking on metal. We killed. Abe shuddered and tried to push Sasha back away from the Gen Ones. She resisted him. Who did you kill? Sasha asked calmly, as if she was dis discussing the weather. Three continued to speak in distorted words, words wrapped in hisses and gurgles and punctuated by clicks. Her words, however, were clear enough. Weak, grilled, lantern, Three said. Abe's breath caught in his throat. Was Sasha wrong after all? Why did you kill Landon? Sasha asked. The cables that trailed out of the darkness surged upward like a black eruption. The Gen 1's eyes glowed brighter. Landon was going to burn us down... Oh, no, never mind. Landon was going to burn down the tower, Three said. We cannot let him do that. It went against our programming. What are you programmed to do? Sasha asked. We are programmed to protect the tenant and protect the building. The building's protection is paramount. It overrides the need... To protect the tenant. Okay, Sasha said in the same even tone she'd used since she'd started chatting with the Gen 1s. Abe was in awe of Sasha. If she wasn't here, Abe was sure he'd be dead by now. He'd have been so panicked and knee-jerk in his reactions that he wouldn't have had a snowball's chance in the hell of having this conversation. A loud thud sounded from the apartment below. What were the Bobby Dots doing down there? Could their systems reach up there? Uh, up here, sorry? 
he decided it was time for him to speak up. Summoning up his courage, Abe looked at Three's glowing eye. Do you know why the Gen 2 Bobby Dots are trying to kill me? The Gen 1s assigned to this unit are experimental. Three began. Abe had to work hard to ignore the continued hisses and clicks. He also had to concentrate to hear their words through all the distortion. In spite of the extensive damage to her vocal processor, Three had a lot to say about the Bobby Dots. Oh god, this is going to hurt. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the Gen 2s were programmed differently than we were, and differently than the Gen 2s and the other units in the building. Their programming was intended to give them more confidence and autonomy. That programming gave the Gen 2s a sense of superiority. They think humans are like parasites that upset the balance of things. They want to remove humans so the AI systems can be more pure and smooth functioning. They won't stop until they achieve their goal. Even though the Gen 1s, with their broken metal limbs, glowing eyes and undulating cables, continued to freak him out, Abe found himself responding to Three's explanation. But they acted like they liked me. The Gen 1s are fascinated by humans, Three said. They love, they hate, at the same time. Sasha reached for Abe's hand. They clutched at each other. Any idea how we're going to get out of this alive? Abe asked Sasha. Sasha looked at Three's pulsing pink eye. Do you know how to deactivate the Gen, one, uh, the Gen 2s? The tenant can manually initiate a system update, Three said. Abe shook his head. Uh, no, I suggested doing that when I thought you three were trying to hurt me. Rose said it couldn't be done. Three's cables whipped out, barely missing Abe's knee. She lied, Three said. For some reason, Rose's lie made the Gen 2's betrayal even more painful. Abe shook off his silly, hurt feelings. Okay, he said. So, if I do the update, that will deactivate them? Three's cables quivered around her skull. That only stops... Oh, wait, no, never mind. That only stops their current actions ter temporarily. After you do the update, you have to cut the power to wipe the Gen 2s at the panel on the wall in the office. Abe imagined the distance between the trap door and the office. He opened his mouth to ask how they were going to do that without being electrocuted or crushed. But a deafening metallic... Uh, metallic crack stopped him. Abe turned to look behind him, just in time to see a pipe running along the outside wall of the crawl space burst open. Water began spewing from it like a geyser, creating a rushing current that coursed through the crawl space. The Gen 1 screamed. They crawled closer to Sasha and Abe. Abe, staring at their broken metal endoskeletons and exposed wires, started to shrink back, but Sasha held him in place. They're trying to protect us, Sasha said. Abe looked at the water sluicing through the cool space. It was filling the troughs, uh, the troughs between the ceiling joists, creating a gridwork of rivers above the drywall. I don't think they're going to be able to do too much, Abe shouted. That drywall isn't going to hold up the water. That was what I was trying to warn you about earlier, Sasha shouted back. I put my hand on the drywall and it started to give. Abe nodded. Once the, drywall, once, eh, once the drywall gave way, even if they could cling to the ceiling joists, the Gen 2s would have access to them, and with water churning around them, how, was, how would they hang onto the joists without drowning? Abe looked around for something he could use to clamp off the burst pipe, or something he could use as a weapon. Other than the Gen 1s themselves, he saw nothing. And suddenly, the Gen 1s vanished as the drywall gave way. The entire apartment ceiling, the floor of the crawl space, collapsed and dropped into the apartment below. The Gen 1s, not well balanced on the ceiling joists, were immediately caught in the waterfall, and they tumbled out of the crawl space, falling down into the apartment. Sasha and Abe attempted to hold onto the metal joists, but the Gen 1s' trailing cables ensnared them too, and they too were pulled free of the crawling space. Their bodies, along with chunks of drywall, plummeted downward. The drop was so sudden and fast that Abe didn't even have time to yell out. 
Sasha was silent too. Abe tried to see past the sheet of water that carried them downward. Through the blur, he saw Sasha's arm and tried to grab it. He knew the landing was going to be hard, and he wanted to try to get her on top of him, but he didn't have time. They landed, and they lucked out. They both ended up on the sofa, which was now sitting diagonally across the living room, having been tossed around the apartment during the Gen 2's tantrum. Abe scrambled to his feet. He started to jump off the sofa. He wanted to get to the door in the hopes that the water had somehow made escape possible. Sasha grabbed Abe's arm. Don't look! Um, what? <laughs> Sasha pointed at sparkles sizzling at the bottom of the apartment walls. Undulating spikes of blue were skimming across the surface of the water pooling on the floor. The flooded apartment was electrified. The Gen 1 screams grabbed Sasha's attention. She turned toward them. Abe followed the direction of her gaze. The Gen 1s were caught in the electrical currents. They were writhing as if in agony, their limbs windmilling, their cables flapping. Around them, the water level was rising. It was nearly to the bottom of the sofa's seat. Sasha stared at the Gen 1's agony and horror. Abe grabbed Sasha's hand and pointed at the water level. We have to get higher, she shouted. We need to get on top of a partition. Sasha wiped her face with the back of her hand and looked around. She nodded. Abe boosted Sasha onto the top of the nearest partition, even though Gemini's teeth-bared face filled the partition's glass panel. He noticed Sasha grit her teeth as her legs slid over Gemini's holographic image. He didn't blame her. He didn't want to touch the panels either. It was like touching the Gen 2s. But the Gen 2s were holograms. They were energetic projections. They clearly had the ability to use the energy to affect inanimate matter like furniture and kitchen utensils, but they couldn't grab on to Sasha or Abe. All Gemini could do when Sasha's foot was planted on top of Gemini's head was cry out in anger. Abe ignored the cries as he followed Sasha onto a narrow chrome shelf that topped the panel. Water still poured from the ceiling. Abe wiped his eyes and looked toward the main terminal between the living area and the kitchen. It was at least 15 feet away. The panel they were on didn't extend that far. They were going to have to jump to three other half walls before they could reach the one that they needed. Abe started to try to rise to his feet. I have to get to the main terminal, Sasha nodded, understanding his plan. Abe carefully repositioned his legs so he could get to the foot under him. Once he'd done that, he started to raise himself up. The six foot width of the chrome panel tops created a surface that was sufficiently stable to stand on, or it would have been if the chrome wasn't water drenched. The wetness, unfortunately, made the metal slick. As Abe attempted to get his balance, he felt like he was trying to ice skate on a high wire. Twice, as Abe started to rise to his full height, his feet slipped. Twice, Sasha grabbed his legs to keep him from sliding down the panel into the water below. Finally, Abe got his footing. Sasha lifted her hand. Help me up. Why don't you wait here? Abe protested. Sasha pointed at the water, which was rising even faster now. I don't mind waiting, but I'd rather be standing than kneeling. That way, I can move quicker if I need to. Abe nodded. He took Sasha's hand and helped her transition to a standing position. To get and keep his balance on the partition, Abe had been forced to block out everything that was going on around him. Now he glanced around. The Gen 2s were popping in and out of view on the panels. One second they were close, ranting and raving. The next second they were on distant panels, flickering in and out of focus. The apartment light was still out, but the Gen 2's bright colours flashed like menacing rainbows throughout the space. Below the streams of coloured light, the water kept rising and the electricity continued to spark. The Gen 1's agony went on. When Sasha reached a standing position, Abe realised they had another problem. The partition was starting to wobble. Now they had not only had to ice skate on a high wire, they had to surf at the same time. I think the best thing to do is move fast, Sasha said. The more we hesitate, the more chance we have of falling. Abe wasn't sure that was true, but he didn't think it was a good time for a debate. He did have one question, though. We? I thought I was doing it alone. Sasha gestured at the partition. Do you think this thing is going to hold when you leap off of it? Abe got, uh, got her point. You're right. We'll go together. Sasha said. Abe nodded. Slowly and mincingly, Abe and Sasha rotated so they were facing the next partition. On three, Sasha said. One, Abe started. Two, three. Sasha and Abe jumped as one person, but Abe, his legs much longer than Sasha's, reached the next panel first. He reached it so quickly that his momentum nearly took him over the top of it. 
he had to jerk himself backward to stop his forward progress. And at the same time, he had to pull Sasha toward him. Her foot hadn't quite landed on the top of the panel, and she was starting to skid downward toward the lethal water. I've got you! Abe shouted before he was actually sure that he did. Thankfully, Abe was able to pull Sasha close and give her a chance to find purchase on the chrome shelf. As soon as she did, however, the partition began to sway. It was giving away like the last one. We have to do it again! Abe yelled. Now! Water continued to pour over them. They both sputtered and snorted, swiping at their eyes so they could see. Another leap. Another slip sliding landing on the next partition. Abe's feet skittered, uh, uh, skidded t sideways along the top of the panel as she landed. Um, Sasha once again barely made it. She only got one foot on top of the chrome. Her other one began skimmering downward. Abe gave Sasha a yank. Her dangling foot groped for the top of the chrome and found it. This partition, like the last two, began to wobble, teetering dramatically. Both Sasha and Abe threw their arms out to keep their balance. One more, Abe yelled. One, two, three, Sasha shouted. They leaped again. This time Abe nailed his landing, his feet square on top of the chrome, on top of the chrome shelf. And because this panel was near the cabinet cutout that had surrounded the refrigerator before the Gen 2s had started throwing things around, he was able to grab the edge of it to steady himself. And that was fortunate, because Sasha's landing wasn't as good. As soon as Sasha's feet hit the chrome, they skidded off and headed down the glass. Sasha grabbed for her glass panel, and she was able to catch herself, but she was dangling perilously close to the water below. She let out a terrified howl. Abe immediately reached down and grabbed Sasha's arm, grunting, digging deep to find every ounce of strength that he had. He pulled Sasha straight up until her feet were settled next to his. The panel began its inevitable seesawing. Abe quickly turned and faced the main terminal. His fingers flew across the keyboard on the glass panel and he initiated the system update. Sasha shouted, Look! Abe turned, clutching the fridge enclosure, and watched as the Gen 2's images began to deconstruct. Their bodies came apart and then joined together again in topsy-turvy ways. Feet came out of the tops of their heads, their pigtails streamed from their bellies, their hands jutted out from their eyes. They began spewing words, but none of them made sense together. Cookies, research, over, review, pet, stronghold, threat, romantic, new, infantry. On and on, a nonsensical stream of words filled the apartment. The Gen 2 systems were crashing, but they were still just as active. Abe turned and looked at the two partitions he needed to reach to get to the office. He coiled, getting ready to leap. Before he could, the dining room table caught in the sparkling and swirling water shifted violently. It slammed into the partition closest to Abe and took it out. The partition went over like a felled tree, slapping the water and sending sparks flying. Oh no! Sasha moaned. Abe understood her despair. There was no way he could get to the office now. He couldn't jump far enough to reach the next partition beyond that one that had just bit the dust. Had all this struggle been for nothing? As if confirming their impending doom, the partition they were balanced on canted sharply. Both Abe and Sasha lost their footing and began slipping down the glass. Abe's gaze locked on the waiting electrified water. It was going to be the last thing he would ever see. Suddenly, the water seethed. The Gen 1s burst up through the roiling waves, electricity still crackling over their metal endoskeletons. The Gen 1s en masse extended their cables outward. The black cord shot this way and that, snapping through the air, reaching out of the sitting area, into the kitchen, beyond into the office, and also into the bedroom. Within seconds, the end of each cable was linked to an electronic connection. Cables plugged into wall sockets and computer terminals. They crisscrossed the entire apartment like electrical grid work. A deafening pop filled the apartment. Shiny trails of electrical current crawled up the walls and spiraled, spiraled across the ceiling. Sputters and pings and fazzles, or fazzles? fizzles chased one another through the space. The Gen 1s let out resonate, resounding sorry, squalls that vibrated all the way through Abe's body. Then they were silent. The water's swells flattened out. The Gen 1s went limp and sank beneath the water's surface. The glass panels darkened. The overhead lights came on. Abe and Sasha finished their slide down the partition. They landed thigh deep in water. And they didn't die. Sasha looked up at Abe. What just happened? Abe shook his head. I think they fried the whole system. Sasha sloshed over to Three, who lay on her back under the water, her one eye dark. Oh, the poor things, Sasha said. The wall phone in the kitchen rang. Abe looked at it. 
Exchanging a glance with Sasha, Abe waded toward the phone. Yes, he answered. Maintenance, an automated voice said. We have a flood warning for your unit. Abe thought of Sasha's file under that file that under duh, saying. He smiled. Yeah, I'm sorry, the tub overflowed. Not a problem. We'll send someone up in a bit for cleanup. <laughs> Oh, this is good. <laughs> I like this. Abe got off the elevator and repositioned the heavy bag he had slung over his shoulder. Two young guys Abe recognised from the Pizza Plex's marketing department were waiting to get in the elevator. Hey, Abe, one of the guys said. Hey, Pete. Did you see the game Saturday? Pete asked. Abe nodded, then shook his head. No defence. You got that right. Pete shook his head too. He and the other man, Dean got on the elevator and waved as the doors closed. Abe smiled. It was so nice not having to hide from his neighbours anymore. The fallout from the flooded apartment and the fact that Abe occupied it hadn't nearly been as bad as he had expected it would be. Apparently the tower's administrators were so happy that Abe's unauthorised tenancy had resulted in solving the apartment's Bobby Dots issues they had decided to overlook how... Abe got into the apartment to begin with, and how much damage had resulted before all was said and done. Abe whistled as he strode down the hallway. He couldn't believe how great the last three months had been. He'd gone from total isolation and near death to living the life of his dreams. Abe looked down the hall and saw Sasha pushing open the apartment door with her hip. Her arms were filled with bags of groceries. Hey, you're a furly too, Abe called out. He hurried to get to her so he, he could help her with the bags. Sasha turned and smiled at him when he reached her. Hey, handsome, she said. Hey, delusional. <laughs> he grinned and bent over to kiss her. As always, the kiss made his toes curl. Let me take those, Abe said. Thanks, but I've got them. She's such a girl boss. <laughs> she genuinely is. I love her. I love Sasha so much. Best character, honestly. Like, she is amazing. Um, Sasha flashed a big smile. Together they stepped into the apartment and let the door close behind them. Abe looked around the apartment's new colourful decor. After the apartment had been cleaned up and repaired, he and Sasha had decided that they were better together than apart. Because she loved the idea of the tower, in spite of what they'd endured, they'd moved all her bright cosy furnishings and curtains and artwork and knickknacks into his space. The apartment no longer looked cold and barren. It was filled with vibrant, joyful life. Like Sasha herself. The apartment was going to have another new addition too. At Sasha's suggestion, she and Abe had remodelled the office, turning it into a small bedroom. Abe's mum would be moving in soon. Oh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. I, I, I forgot about the ending, honestly. It's like, it's a really good ending. Sasha pointed at Abe's bag. So, what did you find? Abe opened his bag and showed Sasha its contents. She clapped her hands at the abundance of robotic parts he'd been able to salvage from the sewer level during his lunch hour. The sewer, as it happened, didn't bug him anymore. After what he'd gone through in his own apartment, nothing wandering around in that subterranean animatronic graveyard was going to scare him. Sasha poked through the parts. These are great! She carried her grocery bags to the kitchen. I got what we need for our stir fry. After dinner, we'll get to work. Can't wait. Me neither. Sasha gave him another kiss. There were never too many kisses. As soon as they'd cleaned up after dinner, Abe reached to the string dangling from the trapdoor in the ceiling. He tugged on it, and a drop-down ladder unfolded to the floor. Abe motioned to Sasha. You go ahead. I'll pass the parts up to you, and then join you. Sasha nodded happily and climbed into the crawl space. Abe handed up the parts and then went up the ladder himself. You were so brilliant to build this, Sasha said, patting the ladder. You were so brilliant to think of it, Abe said. They laughed together and settled on the plywood floor they'd installed above the ceiling joists. <clears throat> this is this part is so funny, okay, ready? You gotta be ready for this. You like I'm you have to be mentally prepared. The floor, nice and dry, easily held their weight. Abe and Sasha laid out the parts. Oh, you found an arm. 
Elizabeth's going to be so happy. <laughs> oh, baby, it's the CEO of Fastball Entertainment. Oh, it's so am- No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> that does not confirm that. Oh, no, let me, let me count. Let me continue so that you actually get context. Abe smiled. Not long after he and Sasha started working on the Gen 1s, they got 3's vocal processor online. 3 was able to communicate that she and the others were grateful for Abe and Sasha's help. Sasha decided the Gen 1s needed names, and she proceeded to name the robots after queens. 3 was Victoria. 1 was Elizabeth. 2 was Isabella. Okay. <laughs> Now listen, now, okay, okay, actually no, I'm, I'm gonna say it at the end of the story, we're so close. It won't be much longer before we're able to talk uh, to all of them, Sasha said. Abe grinned. Nope, not much longer at all. He looked at the Gen 1 still forms. Although they were unmoving, they didn't look half bad. In the last two weeks, Abe had been able to find new legs for Isabella, and he had found a new replacement eye for Victoria. For, uh, Victoria. Sasha had been... Uh, able to use the pieces of plastic and exoskeleton Abe had found to replace Victoria's missing pieces, and she nearly had enough to form an entirely new exoskeleton for Isabella. Abe and Sasha got to work. Pretty soon, they'll be good as new. They're going to love helping out your mum, Sasha said. That was their plan. Instead of living in a care centre, Abe's mum would be able to live here, watched over by the refurbished Gen 1s. Abe grinned. I think she's going to love them too. Oh, I got the chills. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's so good. Oh, this story is brilliant. I'm going to cry. Oh, it's so good. I love how like, I love how like the, the mother with her dementia being in like a care home is like a side plot. And I love how they bring it all back at the end. And it's so happy. Like, this is one of the happiest endings I think we've ever had in in the entirety of the FNAF books. I, honestly, right? 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 This has to be the happiest ending. It has to be. There is nothing bad about this about this ending. Apart from the fact that they're living under Fast Entertainment. But we'll talk about that another time. Uh, so a few things I'd like to point out. Um... Because I I didn't want to talk too much in the ending because like big reveals I I mean like be honest in the comments who genuinely thought the Gen twos were evil I thought that was like I thought it was kind of predictable but I thought it was still like a really good reveal I think it was really well done uh, and I I think like Sasha is honestly she Sasha kind of like shines in this in in this in this story like. She makes this story ten times better. I think that the the story would have been really boring if it was just Abe, uh, like alone again. Uh, and so it's great that he that he had company, and I think their chemistry was really well written and just really good in general. I think it was all amazing, and Abe has such a happy life now. Um, so that's really cool. I think one of the coolest reveals is that Landon uh, was gonna burn down the Fazplex Tower. So I want to know why. <laughs> I want to know why Landon was going to burn down the tower. I also, like, at one point during the reaction, I know I keep going back to this, but uh, at one point during my first reaction, which you can go and watch after this, actually, if you want to, uh, it is like an hour long, but still. Uh, one of my original thoughts was that Landon was Michael Afton, uh, with a different name, and that Michael Afton was still alive. Landon was still alive, living in, like, in like different place but obviously Landon is dead now um maybe that's why Michael maybe that's why Landon wanted to burn down the Fastplex Tower uh but probably not um so let's just like talk about one thing real quick um that I wanted to talk about just a second ago so <laughs> and this this is going back to my reaction video that I did so three was Victoria one was Elizabeth two was Isabella we have heard all three of those names. We have heard all three of those names before and all of them are somewhat related. Like, okay, somewhat related. I'll describe in a minute what I think. 
somewhat related to baby. <laughs> right? I know I know they're all I, I know it's probably a crackpot theory. I know it's definitely a crackpot theory actually. But um I love uh, I love how they like leave it open like this, like just casual like oh yeah, they named them after Queens, Victoria, Elizabeth, Isabella. So Elizabeth is the easy one. Elizabeth possesses Circus Baby, uh, and that's that. Victoria. Where have we heard the name Victoria before? Oh, that's right. The story Help Wanted, where Victoria is a robot. Oh my gosh. So, Victoria is a robot, uh, and she is freaking... What's his name in, in the story? Oh, Steve. Of course, Steve Snodgrass. She is Steve's supposed wife, but revealed to be a robot. Uh, and she's like the stand-in for Baby and that because if you play FNAF VR, obviously, and you play the Night Terrors, there's one level where where you have Elizabeth, uh, n not Elizabeth, Baby, uh, who does like very similar actions to Victoria in that story, uh, even like to the point where uh, he's hiding in the closet and, you know, it, and Baby is like looking at you, whatever. Um, yeah, so th there's some similarities there, I would say. Uh, and Isabella. <laughs> Isabella. Can you think of where Isabella has been used in the series? Probably not. And, like, again, this is probably my biggest crackpot theory ever. Um, because it's, like, such a huge stretch, but I think it's just so funny that this is the first place my mind went to. So Isabella is actually the girl at the end of Dance With Me, uh, who supposedly gets possessed by Ballora at the end, but probably not. Uh, it's probably just a happy ending. Um, but in Dance With Me, of course, that's Circus Baby's Pizza World, uh, and it's connected to Baby somewhat in that way. Uh, again, it's it's like a huge stretch, but uh, I, I think that the name choices there like really threw me off because they, they just had to go ahead and use names that we've seen before. Um, but yeah. Just so, just to clarify, I don't think it does actually mean anything. I think it's just goofy names that they put out there. I don't think it's going to come back in any way. I think it's just funny. <laughs> that That's where my mind went to. Anyway. What a brilliant two-part story. Um, we have been told this isn't going to be our only two-part story. Um, not only do we have uh, B7 and B72, supposedly, in the future, because we've got a full cover for that. Uh, and I actually want to do like a theory video on my predictions for that story because I have so many thoughts on how B7 can be continued into a full, full on like sequel. So I'm going to do a, a video on that soon. Um, and we also have um, a kind of like a sequel to the storyteller. It could be a, a sequel or a prequel. And that is the mimic. Uh, and also we have a sequel or prequel to that. Tiger Rock. So, uh, oh, I kind of just spoiled something from Storyteller if you didn't read Storyteller. Anyway, uh, I'm pretty sure you did. That is really cool. We're getting loads and loads more uh, stories like this. And I really like how this was formatted. I really like how they took their time with this. They could have fitted all of this in to one story. They could have put it all in one book. Um, I, I mean, like, they could have done... They could have shortened this by half. But they didn't. They chose this story... And we're like, you know what? This is going to be a two-parter because our writing is so good. Our characters need to be developed more uh, than usual. And, you know, this story deserves more words. <laughs> um, I think that's just how, how to put it. So I really like that we're getting more lengthy stories and more deeper dives into characters and events and stuff like that. Anyway, that is, I think, all I have to say about this story. I think it is absolutely phenomenal one of the best stories in fast for frights and tales from the pizza plex i would say so far and i think a lot of people are going to agree with that but uh what do you think let me know in the comments below thank you guys so much for listening along to my audiobook or just read through um and yeah i'll catch you when we read epilogue six which i actually haven't read yet so that's gonna be interesting apparently it's not amazingly interesting but um we'll see <laughs> Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.